This is a... Uh... Hello and welcome to our session on... Uh, welcome to our session on U-14. Are we live now? I hope so. Uh, hello, this is Seth Stein. I'm president of the Natural Hazard Section, and welcome to the Science for Solutions uh, Union session that is joint between us and uh, GeoHealth. So my co-chair is Ben Zajic. Now, AGU's strategic plan emphasizes science for solutions to societal problems. Now, for a lot of the union, that's those are, that they're thinking about how to do that. For our two sessions, this is very much in our DNA. Both sessions, both sections are interested in how to both do fundamental science and put it to good use. So we decided to organize a session to illustrate some of the things that our people are doing um, and how we want to both advance scientific discovery and use the results. And this very much fits into the recent activation of especially our younger membership worldwide in, uh, in the union about dealing with racial and economic inequality and social justice. So we've invited a group of people spanning the two sections to give some insights into what they're doing. And I think you'll find it really interesting and you'll find that there's commonalities between the approaches that are taken in these two sections and hopefully approaches that will increasingly become common in the AGU uh, in, the year, in the year to come. So in that spirit, let me, I'd like to uh, welcome you and uh, let's go to the video. This is a, a talk about how we can use science to improve seismic resilience. And this is a theme that we took up last year at AGU in San Francisco. So I'll talk with you about that and also about how we in particular use these concepts to help improve the, the resilience of the electric power grid and how this has been done by our companies mine, Southern California Edison, and Stu Nishenko's Pacific Gas and Electric. And this has been over the course of many decades, uh, long-term work to improve societal resilience when it comes to our electric power infrastructure. So there's actually a video available online from last year's AGU panel meeting in which we were fortunate to be joined by Naomi Kelly from the city and county of San Francisco, who's in charge of the capital investment program, which includes seismic resilience as a major part of it. We also had Mary Lou Zoback's presentation on societal resilience. She led the 1906 centennial earthquake um, commemoration in which there was discussion about how these investments in seismic resilience for the Bay Area have really been remarkable. And Tom Broker also presented there, talking about how over $73 billion has been invested since the Loma Prieta earthquake of 1989 in the Bay Area for seismic resilience, primarily in terms of building retrofits, but also transportation, the Bay Bridge and others, and several billion in total into the electric infrastructure through PG&E's efforts that work was also shown by Stu Nishenko in his AGU presentation from 2005, uh, in which he also emphasized the successful use of engineering and geology together to help design the Trans-Alaska Pipeline where it crosses the Denali Fault. So this work was all done in anticipation of a future earthquake by Alieska, and this shows you in the photo on the right where the Denali fault rupture then actually did occur, a magnitude 7.9 earthquake, and not a single drop of oil was spilled. So a USGS fact sheet describes that in much more detail, but we consider that to be a preeminent example of how when geologists and engineers do the science right and have the opportunity to design in that resilience, we can be very successful with those mitigation efforts and even during design and construction for the very first time uh, with infrastructure like this. So I would encourage you to look at also online the uh, hashtag NH24A. That'll take you to the, the tweets that were done at the time of last 
AGU's uh, panel session. I really recommend that to you if you'd like to learn more about this whole subject. Now, when it comes to critical infrastructure and electric power in particular, we do a fairly standard approach to this problem. We look at where the critical facilities are. These are buildings, and in the case of uh, substation buildings, many of these are not occupied buildings. Uh, we also look at where the substations are, and especially those with the large transformers. And then we look at the bulk transmission infrastructure, that is the towers as shown here, and what are called the conductors, that is the wires that are strung between the towers. We look at where the active faults are, like in California, the San Andreas Fault, but also the secondary faults that are also quite important, like in the Bay Area, that would include the Hayward Fault and others. And in Southern California, that would certainly include also the San Jacinto Fault, the Elsinore Fault, the Newport Englewood Rose Canyon Fault. So in both Northern California and Southern California, we have not only the San Andreas Fault to be concerned with, but many others. And as those of us in the field of earthquake engineering and science, we all know this, it's also possible that not only the, the faults of greatest or, or secondary importance, but also many other faults are potentially threatening to the infrastructure. The bottom line when it comes to the electric power infrastructure is that people want the lights to come on when they flip the switch. It's really as simple as that. And then our goal in these seismic resilience efforts is to make sure that we restore power as quickly as possible. So say there's an impacting event, a future earthquake occurs, and say that it takes out the power as past earthquakes have done. We need to do damage assessments very quickly, and then we need to make repairs as quickly as possible. So that's our entire emphasis when an earthquake occurs to get what's called situational awareness in very quickly from the field. So the very first thing we do is we take modeled estimates of the ground motions and measured ground motions from USGS and the state of California. The Northern and Southern California seismic networks take that information in very quickly and then USGS and its partners put out a shake map. We and PG&E also, other utilities as well, use ShakeCast, which can be used to combine information about these critical facilities and the lines between them. Uh, that information can then be combined with the shake map and a prioritized list is then output from the ShakeCast software, which we then use as a basis to deploy those people who have the training to do the damage assessments. And this all takes place as rapidly as possible. So what we're trying to do is replace those modeled estimates of ground motions at our critical facilities as quickly as possible. We're trying to replace those estimates with actual field reports from boots on the ground, people deployed to uh, look at what the actual damage is. We get that information in and then follow that up with prioritization and then actual work to make those repairs. So this is just sketching quickly for you the process that we go for, go through in order to restore power as quickly as possible. We're aware that in case of a big future earthquake, that that disruption to the power may take place over a long interval and we wanna shorten that interval. How we do that is through mitigation efforts ahead of time. So our goal is overall system resilience. And this really goes not only for PG&E service territory and SCE service ter territory in Northern and Southern California. It also goes for the entire Western grid. Bonneville Power up in the Pacific Northwest has similar considerations and some of the work that they've done in terms of base isolating a large transformer as a demonstration project has also been very important. And we are connected literally throughout these service territories to one another. And the Western grid in order to be stable and to get it back up again, we need to work together. So there are all these issues about system interoperability between us, as well as the considerations each of us have about our own resilience. Now the photograph on the lower left shows you a toppled transformer from the 1971 Silmar earthquake, where anchoring, as you can see here, is very important. If the anchoring is insufficient, large system components can topple and go out of service. And 
as you can see, that would be a major issue then to repair that. As we've seen in other earthquakes around the world over time, other elements at these substations can also fail, like the bushings on the large transformers as shown in the lower right. So in the 2008 Wenchuan earthquake, for example, some of the imagery that we saw soon after that earthquake included severe damage to a substation near Yingzhou, which was in the epicentral area, and large transformers and their bushings failed in that case. We know that some of these large transformers are such specialty items, they can weigh 400 to 500,000 pounds, so they're difficult to move. If one is damaged, and needs to be replaced, that can be in and of itself a major job to simply replace one large transformer. Now I mentioned not only the substation equipment is important for the electric infrastructure, but also the buildings. Each of these substations has buildings that house important equipment. We also have, in addition to the substation buildings that are typically unoccupied, we also have an information technology IT buildings that tend to be unoccupied but the structural integrity of buildings, even if they're unoccupied, can be quite important. So just a conceptual diagram from our FEMA standards guidance shows you how we have considerations like life safety for our buildings. SCE has about a thousand buildings. About 170 of those buildings are occupied, but then a large number of those buildings are also important for rapid restoration of electric service. So we have considerations, not only life safety, but other considerations as well when it comes to overall system resilience. We need our buildings to withstand the hit of a large earthquake shock. So conceptually, the earthquake forces might damage or even potentially collapse a building. And we do have older buildings, some of which have not yet been seismically retrofitted. We're in the process of prioritizing and going through a systematic evaluation assessment and then planning for seismic mitigation in a structured approach where we are um, at first taking the top priority and seismically retrofitting those buildings. And then we are stepping through in an iterative process where we are going through that work and doing the seismic mitigation in order. And it's taking time, but that's a, an ongoing process. So. As FEMA and ASCE and ATC make revisions through time in the uh, life safety and other provisions of seismic code, there's a constant process of um, figuring out which older buildings need to be upgraded and then taking care of that. So the work keeps going, it's iterative, and I don't see that it'll ever stop because we continue to inform that decision-making as the engineering and science improves, as our knowledge of what ground motions will be in the future at these existing sites where we have critical infrastructure at risk. So that's depicted in the upper right diagram where you see that through time going from left to right, the system status is improving through time generally and in a pre-disaster timeframe, which is when we're doing all the retrofits and mitigation work, we see that we can do a lot during that time interval to improve performance of the system. So without improvements, the system performance, you would see it have a dip at the time of a disruptive event. And then we would work hard to restore performance with time. We can decrease that performance hit by doing mitigation ahead of time. So the upper curve, the solid dark black curve shows the more resilient system. And that's our objective is to continually strive to do better and to make these improvements so that when a future earthquake hits, we have less impact and we're able to restore power to the people that much sooner. And so this is of great societal importance. It's just one example with the critical infrastructure represented by the electric power industry. I hope that I've been able to help um, clarify how it works in our case but really it is broader than that. It applies to the other critical lifeline infrastructure sectors like transportation, very similar efforts across the board. As I mentioned at the beginning, our panel last year at AGU considered for the Bay Area, this over $73 billion in seismic system retrofits to help decrease the impacts of a future earthquake. Similarly in Southern California, over a similar time interval, in our case, in Southern California, 
really since the Northridge earthquake of 1994, there's also been tremendous investment in seismic resilience. So those earthquakes were motivating the 89 Loma Prieta earthquake in the Bay Area and the 94 Northridge earthquake in Los Angeles. The motivation that was especially strong soon after those earthquakes, to be honest, has been on the decline. And so we, the community of earthquake engineers and scientists have worked together in both of those areas to create first the shakeout scenario in 2008 and its accompanying documentation Many papers were written about how a magnitude 7.8 earthquake on the Southern San Andreas Fault could impact the regional infrastructure. And so we were in that case trying to add vivid detail and scientific realism to a so-called big one on the Southern San Andreas Fault. Over the entire span of my career, it's been considered a scientific consensus that the Southern San Andreas Fault is the most likely place to have a future big one in Southern California. So with the shakeout scenario, we added detail to that and, and then we've been using that ever since. We even just recently used it at Southern California Edison for a full scale exercise where we again considered that 7.8 San Andreas event and what its impacts would be along with our partners in particular in telecommunication. Similarly, we used the haywired scenario in the Bay Area and in 2018, we rolled out volumes one and two of the haywired scenario. Um, these are all available freely online from USGS and from the journals that we publish these works in. Volume three of the haywired scenario reports has recently been released along with a series of presentations led by Ann Wine of USGS. And so I would encourage you to go to these other resources as well. I'm afraid that's all the time I have. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Leah Saldich, and today I'll be addressing the question, should all of Nepal be treated as having the same seismic hazard? This special union session aims to tackle the question, how can we implement AGU's science for solutions to address societal problems? I research earthquake hazards. The current approach to this societal problem has several phases, each with their own unique challenges. First, seismologists create hazard forecasts of future shaking. The challenge here is the large uncertainties in forecasting earthquake occurrence and ground motions. Then, engineers and policymakers create building codes and design structures. Their challenge is developing cost-effective societally acceptable policies. Then, when an earthquake occurs, response and relief can be delivered faster, potentially saving lives. The challenge here, one that is being recognized more now in 2020, is creating community partnerships and ensuring social equity in both hazard preparedness and response. Today, I'm going to be looking at the first piece, the hazard maps using Nepal as a case study to understand how well hazard maps do what they're supposed to do. But first, before we go on, I'd like to highlight the importance of community partnerships for global development and scientific advances generally, with some examples from our experience. Hazard maps by themselves do nothing to reduce risk. Rather, they need a community of local earthquake professionals to be the advocates and agents of change. Organizational partnerships for capacity development between NSET, the National Society for Earthquake Technology in Nepal, and with USAID, the USGS, and the Global Earthquake Model have, since 2009, fostered workshops, trainings, and collaborations with Nepali professionals developing seismic hazard maps. Dr. Sudhir Rajuri, the De Deputy Director General of the Nepali Division of Mines and Geology, has been tasked with making PSHA maps for Nepal. A future focus of this collaboration will be working with Sudhir and others to evaluate proposed maps. Addressing our science challenges. Basic tectonic and earthquake science is crucial for hazard modeling and limitations on the science result from limitations of what we know. There are several sources of uncertainty here. The locations of past earthquakes are not well known and may not fully show the location of future ones. 
This is important because the rupture length of the fault controls earthquake magnitude and shaking intensity. Hence, uncertainties regarding past earthquake source parameters and shaking distributions are important considerations for hazard maps. There are many different views of hazard in Nepal. Plausible alternative input parameter choices for seismic hazard models yield quite different maps. So these maps have significant uncertainties. Here we show different hazard maps that have been proposed for Nepal. These maps all show lower hazard for central Nepal, but is that area any less dangerous than the rest of Nepal? Now, the case for treating all of Nepal as having the same seismic hazard. The GPS data suggests that at oceanic subduction zones, like in Japan on the left, there is variation in coupling that seems to indicate locations of future earthquakes and likely reflects the location of past ones. On the right, we see that Nepal GPS data shows no significant variation in coupling between areas of recent large earthquakes, including the 2015 Gorkha earthquake. Moreover, earthquakes in the past few hundred years have released less plate motion than is accumulating, implying that larger earthquakes are expected. Hence, with present knowledge, the entire zone could be regarded as equally hazardous and perhaps vulnerable to much larger earthquakes than currently known, with long recurrence times. Now, let's see how seismic intensity data allows for hazard map evaluation. Seismic intensity is a measure of ground shaking directly related to damage determined by eyewitness accounts. Here we show historic data from 1636 through 2009, as well as data from the 2015 Gorkha magnitude 7.8 earthquake and the 1833 magnitude 7.5 earthquake. The majority of the population and hence observations are in proximity to the capital of Kathmandu. Next, we determined the observed maximum intensity as measured on the modified Mercalli intensity scale. To do that, data are gridded to find the maximum observed shaking in each cell. Overlaying on the map are the locations of historical earthquakes going back to 800 CE. So how should PSHA maps compare to the observed maximum shaking? By definition, at a point on the map, the probability P that during T years of observations, shaking will exceed the value on a map with a tau year return period is assumed to be exponential. So the figure on the top you see takes the functional form of the exponential uh, cumulative distribution function. This means that there is a 63% probability that shaking predicted by a map with a tau year return period will be exceeded when t over tau equals one or t equals tau. Uh, the fraction of sites f where observed shaking exceeds the mapped value should behave in the same way. And that's what you see on the figure on the bottom. Using these definitions, we develop performance metrics for assessing earthquake hazard maps. There is the fractional exceedance metric, M0, which is implicit in the definition of a probabilistic map. It is defined as the difference between the observed fraction, F, and the predicted fraction, P, of site exceedances. Visually, uh, in the figure on the top, M0 compares the fraction of points that plot above the di diagonal line to the fraction predicted. We also have the squared misfit metric, M1. This quantifies the magnitude of difference between observation and prediction. This metric is not implicit in PSHA, but it's more like a visual comparison as shown in the figure on the bottom. Metrics are useful because they give scores to maps and can be applied to any map for direct comparisons. For both metrics, the lower the score, the better, and zero is ideal.
the performance metrics allow us to make direct comparisons between maps. So let's look at two examples for Nepal. These maps show the estimated level of shaking in Nepal, at which there is a 10% probability of exceedance in 50 years time. On the left, we show the Global Earthquake Models 2020 hazard map for Nepal, which comes from Nath and Thing by Jam 2012's model. On the right, we show the Stevens, Shrestha, and Maharjan 2018 seismic hazard map for Nepal. The two maps have subtle variations due to different parameter choices in the models. For these maps, we converted peak ground acceleration to MMI via the method of Warden et al. 2012. This slide, um, so now we reduce that map to show values only where we have historical seismic intensity observations. Again, the differences here are subtle. This slide shows a map of residuals, which we define as observed minus predicted intensity. Blue colors mean observed shaking was lower than predicted, and red colors mean observed shaking was higher than predicted. As you can see by the amount of blue, these maps both appear to overpredict shaking. The preliminary performance metrics for the two maps are shown here. 55% of sites should have exceeded shaking predictions because of the ratio of the observation period to the return period of the map. The actual percentage is 5%, a factor of 10 lower than expected giving an M0 score of about 0.5. M0 results for the two maps are practically indistinguishable, while M1 is slightly better for the GEM model. So how does Nepal hazard map performance compare to hazard maps elsewhere? It turns out that most hazard maps studied to date over predict shaking. Possible causes are uncertainties in the earthquake history, the ground motion models, or it could be a random effect of the short record. In this figure, we show metric results from the central and eastern United States, Italy, Japan, and California via the California Historical Intensity Mapping Project, also known as CHIMP. Nepal has the highest M0, or the poorest fit, out of all the 475 year models, but the lead is small. The 2016 Central and Eastern United States map for induced and natural seismicity has the lowest M0 or the best fit overall. So in conclusion, basic tectonic and earthquake science is crucial for hazard modeling and limitations on the science result from limitations of what we know about tectonics and earthquake history. Two seismic hazard maps for Nepal are practically indistinguishable based on performance metrics, but both significantly overpredict shaking, and a similar overprediction is seen in California, Italy, and Japan. Nepal might be characterized as having a uniform hazard based on intensity data. And finally, Hazard maps by themselves do nothing to reduce risk. Rather, we need a community of local earthquake professionals and policymakers to be the advocates and agents of change. Thank you. So let us talk about uh, some of the future tsunami scenarios in Cascadia. When we think of Cascadia, the, the first mental image that we have in our mind is of this huge uh, rupture that's gonna break the entire plane interface in the, in the US West Coast. And it's going to create this monstrous tsunami that I'm showing a video of here. Uh, the jury is still out on the shape and size of the rupture and how what the magnitude uh, of that would be. But I think an important question is um, uh, how big of a tsunami is it going to make, and is it does the worst case tsunami scenario necessarily correspond to the worst case rupture scenario? And this is the question I'm trying to answer in this talk. Now, before I start all of that, I'm going to provide a really quick background on how we do things in the tsunami business. So as a result of the earthquake, we think uh, we uh, this is the way we do this. The ocean floor gets deformed here shown in brown and the formation itself is sort of transferred to the surface of the ocean. And um, 
that's going to create a gravitationally unstable system of bumps and troughs on the surface that's going to move around as a result of the force of gravity, and we call that a tsunami. The, the speed of tsunamis are given with this simple equation, sort of GH, G being the acceleration due to gravity, and H being the depth of the ocean. So what this tells me that if I have these two pieces of information, a good map of the ocean floor giving me depth and a good understanding of the surface, I, I'm in business. And these are called initial condition in the tsunami business. We usually have a good understanding of the ocean depth because we have bathymetry maps. Uh, all we need to do is come up with a good understanding of the shape and size of the source. Now, uh, moving on to Cascadia, uh, from uh, the advance of plate tectonics, we have had this notion of this huge subduction zone uh, on the US West Coast. Uh, but it was not like any other subduction zone because it was not many making any uh, big earthquake. Uh, in, in his history. And it was a big enigma until Tom Heaton and Park Stable in the 90, 1985 published this paper in, the, in BSSA and they argued that they'd, they'd inferred from Indian traditions the existence of these events in the past. Uh, a couple a couple of years later, Brian Atwater published this now famous paper uh, uh, presenting evidence of the existence of these rupture in the past uh, from geological uh, data. And the, he finishes the paper with a cautious note saying that we don't really know how big of, a, of an earthquake it will be. And then later on, uh, there was, it was followed with a huge number of papers and Kenji Sataki uh, in Japan uh, uh, the, and his team, they sort of discovered this orphan tsunami in the, in the year 1700, which didn't have an apparent earthquake as, as parent. So they followed up this study with a number of uh, other studies in collaboration uh, with other teams and concluded that it was li most likely an earthquake in Cascadia, uh, probably a magnitude uh, upper eight, magnitude nine earthquake with a distribution with some distribution candidates as uh, as first lip. Now this was the, this is one data point that we have. Uh, what may happen in the future is the big question. And if you just do a little Google search, and this is what I get within my filter bubble. Uh, from a 1700 Cascadia earthquake. And it has an ominous picture here on the right saying that, well, it doesn't necessarily explicitly saying that, well, implying that this is probably something that happens in the future. And this is called the sort of the worst case scenario in ACE in a whole. Now, if plate tectonic has taught us anything over the past 60 years is that, well, this is not necessarily the one uh, scenario. We can get a, a variety of magnitudes and locations in subduction zones, and this was, pioneered with uh, the work of Undo in 1975, he basically divided the Nankai trough into a number of chunks and argued that, the, well, this could either happen, break in one earthquakes or a number of them in the, uh, over time. And of course, this distribution, distribution follows some statistics. And if you know the statistics and have some insight with plate tectonics, you can actually create a number of a large number of fake earthquakes in Cascadia, as uh, Diego Melgar's group have done, and produce uh, tsunami simulations a large number of tsunami simulations for, for that area. And this is exactly what various groups have been doing over time. But as we all know, the bane of existence of this kind of a study is uh, this curve, which uh, is the total cost against mitigation level. And this red curve gives you the calculated uh, model. Now you can play around with all kinds of mitigation scenario, but, uh, but at the end of the day, you have to converge. I mean, it's best if you could converge on this optimum scenario where you can spend the least and get the most out of uh, your model. And this is what you, can, you, you need some physical sense to do. And in order to just uh, so to answer the question whether or not, I mean, we are under mitigating or over mitigating with each of these scenarios, uh, depends on the number of uh, on tsunami simulations. So let's simulate some tsunamis here. So this is a, uh, remember, we need some initial condition as a form of ocean floor deformation from an earthquake. And this is what we predict from locking models. We basically tell you that I can measure deformation on land and can sort of with some tricks extrapolate it offshore and say, well, over time, we know that this amount of strain has been accumulated. And so this is going to be <clears throat> what, what's gonna happen uh, offshore as a result of a magnitude 9.2 earthquake. So this is basically, in other words, this is a slip potential. And so I, I take this slip field from Gina Schmalz's work in 2014 and try to downscale it using earthquake scaling laws to get smaller slips down to you know, very small earthquakes. And from that, I can simulate ruptures. I can say, well, I start from the north, for example, here in magnitude eight scenario, and I rupture southward until I saturate. And this means that I'm pulling from these slip values for a magnitude eight uh, scenario. And this is just an example uh, here for magnitude nine. I start from this little dot here in the north and propagate the rupture in the corresponding slip field until I saturate the magnitude nine level. And then I can move around the rupture, uh, the epicenter to get 
uh, other uh, earthquake scenarios for magnitude nine. And I can do this for all kinds of magnitude scenarios. And this is what I get. Remember, I applied those initial conditions the formations to my tsunami simulation uh, codes. And here is what I get. So here the bottom uh, panel in these two figures is basically the exact same thing in the previous slide, just flip it on the side. You have this mesh as the rupture mesh. And then these, in these both panels on top, I have these black curves, which correspond to the, uh, the, the tsunami profile uh, along the coastline of, Cas uh, of the Cascadia and the US West Coast. And the rest of the curves are other scenarios color coded according to the latitude of the epicenter. So for example, the blue curves here correspond to the blue parts of the rupture, whereas the hot curves, red curves color, correspond to the Southern chunks. And the uh, same thing with the magnitude nine. Now there are three key points I'd like you to take from, take away from this slide. One is that, well, central segments of the subduction zone make wider spans of uh, high amplitude, which means that if I put the rupture in the north, it's going to create a smaller rupture, but it's going to be more local, a, a large rupture, but it's going to be more localized. And I move it to the, to the south, I'm creating comparable tsunami amplitudes, but it's more widespread. And this boils down to the second point in question here uh, for magnitude nine, if I put the source in the, south, uh, in the north, I'm already saturating uh, the magnitude 9.2 uh, scenario. And if I move it south way, I, I'm actually getting about 90%, more than 90% of tsunami amplitudes of uh, in, in, in the entire span of the coastline. So magnitude, upper magnitude 8.7, 8.8, 8.9 seem to be actually good representations of magnitude 9.2. And finally, the maximum tsunami amplitudes occur somewhere here in the middle of uh, middle and Oregon state. It's because we think that it's mostly due to the uh, con concave shape of coastline, which focuses tsunami edge waves somewhere in, uh, in the middle. Now, what about the effects of rupture model? Uh, so, Remember that I mentioned that we use Gina's model uh, here, uh, which a special form of it, which has the formation uh, right off the trench. What if we change the rupture model? So here, the, to, to study this here, we have George Priest's model, a simplified version of it. Uh, and here we have a dynamic rupture that's sort of derived from a locking model. And each step I can simulate the tsunami. And this is what I get. This is the map of tsunami amplitudes. Uh, all across all of these models. And as you can see, as we move away from the coastline, in other words, in the far field, these models are very different, but what about the near field? And they seem to be very similar. And in fact, if you look at the uh, tsunami amplitude profile, this is what you get uh, here. This is remarkable. They're strikingly similar because the blue curve corresponds to locking model here and the red curve in each case correspond to the um, alternative scenario, uh, you know, rupture scenario. And the important pattern is that they have very striking uh, correlation. In fact, they have a correlation more than 0.9 in each scenario. The difference is the absolute amplitude of the of uh, of the runup or the coastal amplitude, which could be attributed to either different scaling laws that you could use or the lack of complex bathymetry. And so, in other words, as long as you're not ignoring uh, a large patch of rupture, a patch of slip as we are here, for example, the difference between these two being, being these huge cluster in the south, you're good. The choice of rupture model doesn't really matter in the near field. And um, this is, I think, a very important uh, understanding of the, uh, of the limit that you can put on your tsunami scenario. Uh, scenario. So but the bottom line is that for Cascadia, if you recall this curve that I showed you before, we can put some labels on this. Magnitude 7.5 is probably, and plus some other things, uh, are going to be at both ends of this. And magnitude 9.2 is very over mitigation. Uh, and we put the upper magnitude 8 in the middle. It's probably the sweet spot that you want to plan your mitigations with. Remember, uh, we can go ahead and make these huge structures along the coastline. But at the end of the day, these are uh, costly because you can do a kind of a quick and dirty calculation and sort of figure out that the cost of um, building this kind of coastal structure in billions of dollars is going to be exponentially increasing as you raise the magnitude threshold. Uh, so we think if you put the cap here in summer 8.7, 8.8, you're good even in this regard. And there are all kinds of things that you can do in between. You can go ahead and do some lectures. You can, do edu you can educate coastal communities. You can uh, work on GNSS. Uh, stuff, which are actually perfect uh, in terms of tsunami warning. You can expand on the existing DART system, or you can use an innovative and very promising systems such as this, you know, smart cables. But the bottom line is that it's all a question of what you choose. And it's also a question of the, what the community needs in terms of either short or long planning. <clears throat> so for example, you can do science assessment, reassessment, then you can 
feed in your, your models, what your output to the economist, and they can calculate these curves. And then there is the question of how to mitigate, how to use this information to warn the public. And remember, you cannot really make this a structure all across the coastline. You need to take many, many other things into consideration. And at the, at the end of the day, it's the combination of all of this uh, with a bit of you know, insight from, uh, further insight from science that uh, results uh, in, uh, in, in policy. Thank you. Hi, my name is Daniel Wright. And today I'm gonna do a little bit different sort of a presentation than what I normally do. Um, but what I want to do is, is not only show you some science that I've been working on for uh, almost 10 years now since my PhD, but um, also a bit of the story uh, that goes around this research. And so uh, my hope is that this is um, uh, a, a nice example, uh, particularly for the uh, graduate students and other early career scientists uh, attending this session. So the story actually starts um, in uh, 2006, when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in the jungles of Bolivia. And I bring this up um, just to make the point that, um, you know, while I was there, I was waking up, you know, every morning and um, then going to work uh, designing and building uh, drinking water supply systems for small farming villages. And so um, certainly at, at that point was an idealistic uh, youth and, you um, and really enjoyed that uh, fact that I was uh, on a day-to-day -day basis um, doing things that really helped uh, improve people's lives. And so um, I took that idealism with me when I went to graduate school at Princeton, um, but this ended up actually being a, a bit of a, a difficult transition uh, moving from the jungles of South America to New Jersey. Uh, and uh, I would say in many ways, the most difficult part of it was reconciling this idealism that I had with some of the realities of uh, graduate school and research more generally. So uh, specifically, you know, the idea that um, uh, once in graduate school, I was waking up every day and instead of feeling like uh, that day was gonna be uh, a, a day that, you know, really uh, improved people's lives. Instead, um, you know, it might take years if not more to uh, develop a piece of research to the point that, um, that it was gonna help uh, uh, provide societal benefit. Um, I was lucky enough to have a, a really good PhD advisor who, who took my um, interests and, and concerns to heart here. And so uh, I'm gonna paraphrase a little bit, but at, at one point early on in uh, my PhD uh, work, my advisor, Jim Smith, he, he asked me this question. He said, well, what if you could simultaneously estimate the multi-scale probability distributions of rainfall and floods everywhere within a watershed. And of course, I'm paraphrasing a little bit here. And, um, and uh, you know, my response to that was cool, but that sounds impossible. Now, um, I don't have time to really go into why exactly this multi-scale uh, aspect is important, but uh, I do wanna mention a little bit about why uh, these probability distributions are important uh, in the first place. And so if you're not familiar with this, um, you, know, you probably at least heard of the 100-year storm or the 100-year flood. And, and this is really just one quantile in the probability distribution of, of rainfall or flooding. And um, the definition of these things being, you know, the 100-year uh, storm, for example, is, is a hypothetical rainstorm that would occur on average once every 100 years or, or a 1% chance of happening in a given year. And so if you look at this figure, uh, for example, um, this is a flood frequency curve, really just a, a way of expressing that probability distribution very similar to a cumulative distribution function. And so why do we care about this sort of stuff? Well, um, they're really, really important when it comes to applications, uh, including infrastructure design, planning and all the regulations that, that go around those things. And then also certainly for floodplain mapping and flood insurance as well. And the probability piece is really important to help make sure that we don't over or under prepare, right? So we could imagine uh, the worst flood uh, conceivable and then you know protect against that, but it would be very, very expensive to do so. And so the probability helps us to balance out the uh, costs and the uh, potential benefits. 
Um, going along with that, though, there can be really high costs or consequences if the you know X year storm or flood numbers that you're using are wrong, right? And this is principally because uh, infrastructure or planning decisions uh, have very long lifespans, you know, five decades or more, oftentimes, and also are very expensive. And so, if you're working based on some numbers that are wrong or perhaps out of date. Um, you can be stuck with the, the consequences of that mistake for a long period of time. And this is a really big issue when it comes to climate and land use change, um, which is leaving uh, some of these statistics, these commonly used statistics, uh, very much out of date. So we uh, tried to come at this problem from a bit different angle, specifically um, starting with this concept of storm transposition. And storm transposition has actually been around for a really long time, more than 100 years at this point. And it's a really straightforward idea. So just to illustrate here, we can think about this August 1903 storm, where as it happened, it had kind of a glancing blow on the Skunk River watershed here in Iowa. But storm transposition is, is saying, well, you know, this storm could have occurred, uh, could have, um, been a direct hit on the watershed, and, and we could assess what would have happened in that case. And so this is showing uh, the flood hydrographs, um, uh, in other words, the uh, time series of river flow. Um, the dashed line is showing the storm as it actually, or the flood as it actually occurred. And then the solid line is showing the um, flood hydrograph that would have resulted if that storm had been a direct hit on Skunk River. And so storm transposition is actually really useful and, and has been used quite a bit for looking at things like what if scenarios or um, you know, worst case scenarios. Uh, but the problem is that it doesn't get at that probability dimension that I said is so important. And so you really have to fast forward um, a, a few decades uh, before um, it was realized that uh, this stochastic storm transposition concept could be combined uh, with some probabilistic uh, approaches to actually get at the probability distribution uh, of, of rainfall or floods. And so here you can see issue one of Journal of Hydrology, uh, this idea was introduced, but importantly um, and interestingly, that first paper didn't have a single figure in it and really practically didn't even have any numbers in it which tells you that something uh, important was missing uh, from, uh, you know, missing and preventing this idea from becoming fully developed. And so there were certainly a number of papers between the 60s and into the 90s, um, but none of them, I would say, really broke out of the, the research realm and into actual uh, uh, practice. And so, um, that's where we stepped in, uh, bringing in our expertise on radar rainfall. And it's really only since around the time that I started my PhD uh, back in 2009 that uh, radar rainfall records have become sufficiently accurate and reasonably long, you know, roughly a decade or more, uh, that you could start to use them for tackling uh, these sorts of questions. And so um, the, the, the point that I want to emphasize about radar here is that its real advantage is that it gives you a very detailed uh, picture in space and time of uh, rainfall. And so here you can see a, a, a rainfall map from August 20th of 2018, a big storm that hit the Madison area. And you can see really high levels of detail uh, in the radar uh, map. In, and you can contrast that with these scattered rain gauge observations that you see uh, around the area. And so um, we did some work basically showing and publishing a paper showing that, yes, you can use this combination of stochastic storm transposition and radar rainfall to look at the probability distributions of extreme rainstorms um, at different watershed scales. So I don't have time to unpack this entire figure, but we have you know, different rainfall durations, uh, probability distributions of rainfall for several different uh, watershed sizes. A uh, really difficult thing to be able to do using more conventional methods. And so then the following year, we've, we, we published another paper, and this figure is even more complicated, and so I'm not even going to try to explain what it's showing. But uh, basically, 
this uh, paper, we showed that you could use this combination of, of approaches to look at the multi-scale uh, distributions of flood uh, magnitudes across a uh, river network or across a watershed. And so um, after I defended my PhD, I, I you know, felt like this was an idea that was still worth pushing forward on. And so I ended up writing a, a proposal that was ultimately selected uh, uh, to NASA's uh, postdoctoral fellowship program. And basically that proposal was to take, you know, the confused collection of, of, uh, of uh, codes that I had written during my PhD and, and convert them into a nice uh, software package. And that software package um, we have uh, called Rainy Day and we've used Rainy Day uh, to do stochastic storm transposition together with uh, uh, rainfall remote sensing data in all kinds of different uh, research applications um, uh, ranging from more basic science, National Science Foundation type things all the way to um, working with the Bureau of Reclamation for more applied applications. Um, but what I want to talk about here is the uh, is some stuff that's happening more close to home, at least close to, to me here in Wisconsin. And so, as I mentioned before, in August of 2018, we had this uh, really uh, big rainstorm. And, and, and um, you know, what, what happens when you have a big disaster like this is that it can really help uh, focus the minds and, and, and uh, really help get people's attention. Um, to, to solve problems. And so that uh, has led to uh, the Wisconsin Rainfall Project, which is a, an applied research and outreach effort that I'm leading that, um, that is um, a, a, an initiative within or a, a, role, a, a project within the Wisconsin Initiative on Climate Change Impacts, which is a clearinghouse for climate change information and expertise in the state. And so the Wisconsin Rainfall Project is a team effort um, so we have funding and expertise coming from the Wisconsin Departments of Transportation and Department of Natural Resources, the Baldwin Wisconsin Idea Endowment, and the City of Madison. And then this project has a number of different pieces, including um, outreach and interaction with professionals around the state, some uh, climate model downscaling to get uh, projections of future rainfall climate uh, rainfall conditions data sharing, but the part that I'll, I'll show a little bit of results from is updating uh, rainfall statistics using uh, this combination of radar rainfall and stochastic storm transposition. And so uh, to do this, we had to take our rainy day software and, and make some pretty substantial changes to it, including uh, putting it uh, essentially on the cloud uh, using high throughput computing systems originally developed at UW-Madison, now used at uh, hundreds of institutions around the world. And so I just want to show uh, some example results here. So here on the left, you can see the 10-year, 24-hour rainfall estimated from NOAA's Atlas 14 project. So this is the most commonly used source of rainfall data uh, in the country. And then in the middle, you can see the results from rainy day. You can see that in rainy day, we're relying on much more recent and up-to-date uh, rainfall records. And then on the right, you can see the difference between the two. And rainy day is, is estimating uh, quite a bit more severe 10-year storm than Atlas 14 is. So just to wrap up then, um, are there some lessons that we can perhaps draw and perhaps that early career folks can apply to their own uh, thinking and their own work? So you know, I think one lesson is read the old literature, but also know uh, what new advances are taking place. Because I think there are some real um, uh, breakthroughs that can be made through combining those two things. Um, you know, nonetheless, it can take really a long time, in my case, almost 10 years to develop an idea to the point where it can actually get used in practice. And then lastly, uh, be ready when opportunity or, or in my case, when disaster strikes. So with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Hi, okay, so this talk is for um, union session on Friday, 11 December. So the name of the talk is Creating a Community of Practice Through Scientific Teams and Support, um, Examining NASA's Carbon Monitoring System and Arctic Boreal and Vulnerability Experiment, CMS and above. 
My co-authors are Matthew Cooper, who was at University of Maryland, and Peter Griffith, who's at Science Systems and Applications at NASA Goddard. So the point of this study is to examine the literature and research uh, abstracts, funding research and abstracts for to determine if they are a community of practice. A community practice is a um, set of ideas which are linked together to which essentially forms a community of learning and of um, engagement, which helps not only improve the science, but also to influence each other. So there are three aspects of a community practice. It's the first, it needs to share a commitment to a specific domain of interest and developing new relationships and connections. So we need to demonstrate here that there are co-authorship, work teams, and shared institutions to form a community. The domain or topical area that the group works on should evolve, allowing for learning to increase competence and define success. And the practice the community conducts allows for working towards similar goals, developing a shared repertoire of methods and vocabulary. Essentially, the three work together, the domain um, of topics of interest, the community where people work together in work teams and have engaged institutions, and the practice in order to understand the body of knowledge, the methods used, the tools developed, The three work together to improve the work of each individual so that the the group is greater than the sum of its parts, essentially. So NASA, CMS, and above, they are two different organizations or funded uh, programs by NASA. CMS um, is focused on applying NASA capabilities to support national and international needs for the carbon monitoring reporting and verification. And NASA's above is a terrestrial ecology program that focuses on research and field campaigns in Alaska and Western Canada, whose objective is to understand environmental change and its implications. The two together are fund, fund societally relevant analysis and data products. They invest in an applications program coordinator who provides support to the investigators and they focus on providing using remote sensing together with modeling to solve specific problems. CMS is global, national, local. It doesn't have a geographic focus per se, but it's topical on carbon. Above is much more broad in its topics, but is focused on Alaska and Western Canada. So the objectives of this, of this paper are to show through a textual analysis that the CMS and above together are a community of practice. We use the PI reported papers as a basis of the analysis, and we analyze shared vocabulary, topic studied, methods used, data sets, vocabulary, and ways of addressing recurring problems. Um, the interesting thing about this approach is that it's a quantitative topic modeling approach to demonstrate a qualitative and learning community, which is stronger through its engagement with each other. So the data we used were 521 peer reviewed papers, which the principal investigators of the funded projects under CMS and above provided directly the references to um, the, their, to above and CMS leadership. So it's 319 papers from CMS and 202 papers from above. Above started a couple of years after CMS, and so therefore it's a little bit behind. Um, And we use the abstract summaries of funded proposals, summaries of the project data and research papers, um, the summaries of the papers published by the funded scientists that were not, uh, that were about the data sets, for example. This is the data we used in the analysis. The methods we used were a correlated topic model, which identifies groups of words that occur together across all the documents. The great thing about this approach is that it removes a lot of um, 
uh, it allows us to make quantitative descriptions of a qualitative relationship. So the topic model allowed us to look at millions of words that were in these papers. We used 100% of the words, every single word in in the paper, including, you know, the references and the, you know, the journal names and everything. Um, we removed current words such as the and that, numbers and punctuation, and we created bigrams, which cre treats two commonly adjacent words as one. So, for example, climate and change would also would be modeled individually and would be modeled together. Um, we also removed the fewer than 10% and greater than 80% to improve the ability of the model to capture the variability and the topics within. So the 15 most common words in use were use, science, differ, difference, can, also model, estimation or estimate, study, provide, system, universe, uh, refer, time, availability, and include. <laughs> Great. So, okay, so now I'm going to present the results for across the three different aspects of a community of practice. The first is the domain. We were able to show the topic connections across all the different, um, uh, across the entire corpus. We put all 520 papers we put into the analysis. Here in this figure, we show that a, the results from tw a 20 topic model. And in the paper in environmental research letters, I believe we also provided a 50 topic model, uh, uh, graph, but it's, really a big mess. So um, here in this, the line width shows how strongly correlated the two topics are, and the size of the label corresponds to the size of the topic in the corpus, and the color shows whether or not it was CMS or above. And what's totally cool about this is that we can see some of these were very, were CMS, like um, disturbance, crop, and simulation that were very, that were not studied to a great extent by above. Like permafrost, snow, and ice was not nearly as prevalent in CMS as in, or in above, in CMS as in above, right? So a lot more studies of permafrost, snow, and ice in above than in CMS, what I'm trying to say. But these orange ones, they were similarly, were, were appeared in papers across both CMS and above. So image, Landsat, and pixel, canopy, LIDAR, and height, parametric, covariate, and prediction, um, et cetera. So what this shows is that there's quite a lot of coherence between the two organizations. They study similar topics. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so topics that are missing from CMS and above have to do with policy and regulation. Um, although both programs seek to support decision makers in the impact of government regulations on conservation, only a small fraction of the literature discusses policy on this topic, 5% of CMS and 3% of above. And then um, the discrepancy is a common problem from scientific programs that are trying to do high-level science and modeling at the same time be relevant of political and economic consequences because there were a few projects that directly engaged economics, political scientists, or analysts. Um, so moving on to the practice connections, here we're interested in seeing how the change in um, the different topics through time. So what we found, if you look at the similar data from that 20 topic model through time, you can see in 2010 when CMS was um, uh, was initiated, and then 2013, when above began, we a, a great increase in the different topics, but we didn't see an emergence of new topics. We saw a coherent, continual engagement and increase in use of these various topics. And this requires that they were developing a shared repertoire of interests, experiences, and tools and we're learning from each other and borrowing each other's methods. So LIDAR was used increasingly across all the different program, programs and projects, for example. And then in the community, we found that both programs held 
periodic science team meetings to work together. The you can see here that the NASA there there were um, key institutions which were funded at the beginning and continually obtained funding year after year. Um, and this was very important for this continuity of funding is critical for for creating a community of practice and for growing and learning the community. And what's really great is even though you see, you know, NASA Goddard, University of Maryland, uh, USDA Forest Service appear year after year, their share of the pie of the total funding has not increased. So they, the the number of opportunities for institutions outside of this key group continues to be present. And so it, that continuity of membership really helps with learning and growing as a community. Um, we also looked at a dynamic model, and I wanted to show this really briefly. And here you can see all of the projects. And this is an analysis, a network diagram based on the the abstract, the submitted abstract for every program, along with the authorship. Um, and what we can see here is a great coherence between the, um, here, let me re reload here. So here, the blue dots are above PIs, and the green dots are CMS PIs. And those three little orange dots in the middle are PIs that were funded under both programs. And you can see that every single dot, with the exception of these two down here, are connected to other PIs or, um, yeah, other PIs in the network. So if we pick, for example, this one, we can see this is a PI, uh, permafrost, which is connected to a CMS project and to a an above project. Every single one of these um, of these. Uh, little nodes is connected to another PI. There are some interesting ones here, so you can manipulate it this way. Yeah, so it's it's completely cool in my opinion, and it allows us to really see how connected these the community is. So to conclude, the support of the engagement, the support and engagement provided by NASA through funding, website building, organizing meetings and providing support for stakeholder engagement has engendered a vibrant and active social network and community of practice. More work is needed in documenting the use of these products and ensuring uh, the impact on policy and decision-making and ensuring that there are uh, lots of useful data products which are engaged with stakeholders. Finally, what, one of the things we really found was that additional engagement and um, participation in above and CMS by decision science, political science, and legal fields would enhance NASA's ability to ensure broad interest and participation and, and to bring along those other communities in the science and to ensure continued breadth, breadth, to continue to breadth, make the breadth of research that is done through time. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to give this union talk. The talk is titled, Converging Research in the Earth, Health and Social Sciences with Humanitarian Practice for Community Protection in Volcanic Eruptions. As I'm sure you're aware, volcanoes produce a multitude of hazards when they erupt. All of these primary hazards that you can see in the diagram on the left can have an impact on human health and well-being. Volcanoes can also cause secondary health hazards through contamination of water supplies, destruction of agriculture, building damage, acid rain and fires. These can all cause injury and death and some of these hazards may exacerbate or trigger diseases. My research has focused on volcanic emissions so mainly ash and gas, and how these can impact respiratory health. The new AGU strategic goals reflect the path that my research has taken over the past 20 years. My work is focused on finding solutions to societal challenges through inclusive research, both across a diverse range of academic disciplines and with governmental and non-governmental organizations. 
My overarching aim is to protect communities from being harmed in volcanic eruptions. I started my career as an environmental scientist with a passion for volcanoes and health. I managed to manufacture a PhD project which brought these together by investigating the geochemical properties of volcanic ash which control its toxicity. But I realized that I needed a network of collaborators across the medical disciplines to help me achieve this. Immediately after my PhD, I formed the International Volcanic Health Hazard Network with my supervisor, Steve Sparks. IVHHN rapidly became a global umbrella organization for research and public dissemination on volcanic hazards and their health impacts. We started to produce informational products and where evidence gaps emerged, we filled them with research. IVHHN is a commission of the International Association of Volcanology, Chemistry and the Earth's Interior and partners with the WHO, which has endorsed some of our products. But IVHHN started off as a network, bringing together experts across earth and health sciences who would be ready to respond to eruption crises and to collaborate on research projects. So my own research has focused on two key questions. Is it harmful to inhale ash? And how can we protect people from inhaling ash? These are questions that local agencies need urgent answers to in eruption crises. The first question requires disciplinary knowledge and collaboration across earth, medical and biological sciences. The second requires expertise in air pollution exposures, personal protective equipment, and critically, social sciences. There is no point working in solutions-based science if the questions aren't those that are being asked by the affected communities. So in this cartoon, the central bubbles are areas where I have developed personal expertise through my training and collaborations. The bubbles on the outside are where I bring in collaborators' um, support. And critically, practitioners and communities are part of that support to ensure the relevance and impact of my research. So these questions cannot be answered overnight or in a crisis without prior scaffolding or networking, which has enabled collaborations to build across academic disciplines, strong partnerships to be developed with practitioners and interdisciplinary research to be conducted. This scaffolding from my research led to the formation of the Health Interventions in Volcanic Eruptions, or HIVE, consortium. This is a partnership to determine the effectiveness of the respiratory protection for community use in eruptions. The partnership involved volcanologists, exposure scientists, PPE experts, behavioral scientists, anthropologists, clinicians, epidemiologists, and ethicists and lawyers from a range of academic institutions, and critically, with a range of practitioner organizations working in Indonesia, Mexico, and Japan. The ultimate goal was to develop public health information for use in eruption crises, but first we had to actually generate the evidence for the effectiveness of different forms of protection. We did this through laboratory studies, of course, but also through social science, because efficacy of respiratory protection is not just about science, it's about risk perceptions, about protection motivations, personal behaviours, and people's trust in advice givers. Unfortunately, there isn't time in a 12 minute talk to describe the research itself, but its successful conclusion led to the development of a range of WHO endorsed printable and audiovisual products and commitments from local agencies to distribute these during future eruption crises. We also completed a train the trainer initiative so that people would know how to fit face masks properly in future eruption crises. Last month, we also published a 12 page supplement of the WHO's disasters bulletin, detailing the outputs from the project and its emerging impact in recent eruptions where agencies have sourced effective face masks based on our findings. but it's not all plain sailing. This type of research is not easy. In the US, interdisciplinary research is sometimes being rebranded as convergent research because of the need for people involved to be able to come together to listen to each other 
to acknowledge differences and values in common, to accept these and learn from them, leading to integration of ideas, innovative thinking, and co-production of research and its outputs. This in turn requires a principal investigator who can skillfully stimulate, mediate, negotiate, and maintain trust and goodwill across the team. And if that fails, and I have first-hand experience of this, the PI has to be able to be capable of taking tough decisions, which will enable the project to ultimately succeed. The team itself needs to be chosen carefully. In disaster research, this may be almost impossible if the team is constructed during the crisis, and that's why we need the scaffolding. To be honest, even in the preparedness phase, an apparently carefully chosen team may have clashes which lead to the team diverging. This may be due to differing values, personality clashes, uh, inexperience in working as an interdisciplinary team, or even an unwillingness to embrace other ways of working. And there are other traits that I've listed here and have experienced firsthand. Like all teamwork, it's a bit like riding a tandem bike. Everyone has to pull their weight and be headed in the same direction. Another major challenge is actually implementing the solution. For there to be uptake, the work must be relevant and useful. And you achieve that by listening, right from the inception of the first project idea. Understanding the context of any community should be at the heart of any research proposal and not an add-on. And this is why social science collaborations are so critical. An important part of disaster research um, is realizing that the affected communities are experts in their own right. They are part of the interdisciplinary team. The Hive project was based on the concerns of communities and they were involved not just in the research, but also in the design of our informational products. We held a workshop in March 2018, attended by local community representatives and regional and national agency representatives in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, which is near Merapi Volcano. We did this so that we could design products together, but one challenge was to give everyone an equal voice, given the range of different authorities present. We achieved this by having different tables. For, so for example, the women from the local community sat together and separate from the men. And we ensured that there was an orator on each table who would represent the views of the whole table. It's also really important to give back to the communities who have given their time. In one location, someone told me that their community had been raped by researchers taking their knowledge and never returning to present their findings or even producing an output that would benefit the community. It is critical that the outputs are not just academic. For the Hive project, we held workshops in all the communities to present our results. This needs to be planned and budgeted for from the start of a project. But it's also critical to check whether the products that you develop are actually helpful. We went back to Indonesia in January 2019 and showed our videos and printed products to the communities that we had worked with at four separate community events. These were celebratory events with food and cultural performances as a final thank you for their participation. But as part of the events, we also evaluated the products for their usefulness by testing the participants' knowledge about ash protection and how to fit a face mask before and after viewing the videos. So to summarize, in order to implement AGU's Science for Solutions strategy, we need to acknowledge that it will be an inherently messy journey. We must take time to build relationships with academic and non-academic collaborators from diverse disciplines and locations. We also need to discuss from the start everyone's expectations and understanding of ethical behavior and to learn about cultural sensitivities. Sometimes mediation will be required, but if we can get it even mostly right, it will have been thoroughly rewarding. Thank you very much. All right, thank you so much to all of our speakers. I'm Ben Zajic, co-chair of the session. Um, and I'm gonna kick things off uh, with some 
couple of the questions that the panelists have asked to each other and should encourage all of our audience members to please uh, be typing into the Q&A box with any questions you have. So the first question is gonna come from Molly. Uh, Molly Brown, you have a question uh, directed at Leah. Would you mind asking that question? Sure, so I wanted to know how she has worked on, on socializing the maps that she created in her research to the community because as you say, maps don't do anything. It's the community who does, does things. Very well put. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I'm i gonna say something that's maybe a little bit um, controversial, but I'm gonna say that I think that hazard maps actually aren't very useful for the public or the layperson in the community. And this is not yeah. only because they seem to be systematically over predicting shaking. This, in my opinion, is because they appear quite simple on the surface, but they actually represent very complex information and surprisingly subtle math. And I think what is maybe more useful for the public in terms of both understanding and an interest is looking at the history of past shaking, looking at observations. And so this is what I did in um, a project called the California Historical Intensity Mapping Project, also known as CHIMP. Um, we created maps of the observed shaking in California going back uh, to the year 1857. And I think maps like this of observations of shaking severity through time can give important information to the public without adding unnecessary complication to the method, the message. Great, thanks so much, Leah. Uh, maybe we'll give a, another panelist an opportunity to ask a question. So Amir, you, you typed in a question for Dan. Do you wanna go ahead with that? Sure, uh, so uh, it was a great talk, Dan, thank you. Uh, uh, what I ha had in mind uh, and actually was fascinated by was the opportunity you got to publish your codes in the form of a well sort of bundled um, uh, software uh, through NASA. I was just wondering uh, if you have any advice uh, to younger sort of uh, researchers in order to uh, how should they go uh, about publishing their codes and if, in other words, like how to get funding for it. Yeah, thanks for the question. You know, I think depending on the day, my response to someone wondering if they should publish their codes is don't do it. Um, you know, I guess, you know, first of all, there's obviously a difference between, you know, uploading whatever code you use to do some analysis for a paper and then uploading sort of a software package that you actually want people to use. And the latter involves particularly if people actually end up using it, it involves quite a bit more commitment on your end because you inevitably get contacted by people saying, hey, this doesn't work or I don't understand it or, you know, that, that kind of thing. And so, you know, you, you basically want to decide whether or not that's a commitment that you really want to um, take on. And then on the funding side of your question, I think for the most part, um, you know, the, the, the funding that has gone into developing, adding more capabilities to the software has has really, the, the proposals themselves have rarely really talked about the software. You know, a rainy day might get a sentence in a proposal. It's all the science and the potential benefits that you really end up needing to emphasize. You know, people don't really, outside of, you know, maybe some very specific funding calls, uh, aren't, aren't really gonna get excited about, you know, your Python code <laughs> or whatever it may be. So, um, so you really have to have the, a, a very clear message about um, what their capabilities are and why those are important. Can I just follow up on that, right? Because this is such a critical tension for so many of us about the effort required to really support a user base. So, so Dan, I, I, I admit I, I went over and checked out the web version of your tool during the talks and um, it's great, it's slick. Are you finding, how, how is the interaction going with your user base? Are, do you take feedback? Are you developing in response to user needs? Um, we, we don't have a very large user base at, at this point. I mean, I could probably count on one or two hands the people who actually um, actually use this for, for, uh, for, for um, real projects, I guess. So, um, uh, 
Yeah, you know, we do, we, we have, it, it's actually been really interesting interacting with that relatively limited number of people because they do tend to be people that really understand the problems and, and um, questions that they're trying to, to answer, right? So, for example, we've worked closely with uh, the Dam Safety Office at the Bureau of Reclamation who are interested in this software for their, um, you know, assessing the, the um, resilience of their dams. And, um, and that has led to a lot of understanding on my part about how to run the software, about how to make some improvements to the software. So that's, that's been a really interesting aspect of that uh, interaction. You know, on the other hand, you get uh, sort of members of the public that want to know, you know, what the flood risk their house is. <laughs> and uh, they want to use rainy day to get it. And, and it's not really even designed for that. And it's, you know, it's, it, like many things, it's, it's sort of relatively easy to run. It's much more difficult to run uh, and get a meaningful answer from and it requires a much deeper understanding. So you, you have to kind of temper people's expectations a bit as well. Sure, thanks so much. Um, we have a question from Sabrina Devada Arias in the audience. Um, to Molly, uh, asking you, first of all, complimenting you on the research and then asking if you've compared topics over time with the prioritizations set up by each of the programs uh, and how do they align or do you find surprises? Um, from my perspective, the uh, the topics over time are quite well aligned, actually. So the two these are two big programs, and they are both very much focused on using satellite remote sensing to answer very large scale questions through models, and they are very focused on delivering those answers to the user community. So. Um, the big surprises we found was really how incredibly similar the um, the use of the data was in the topics. I expected to have a much bigger community of people studying, you know, uh, snow or glaciers, and that really wasn't the case. There's much more about transformation of of um, fire risk and carbon emissions in the region. So, and it might, it's very likely because the two communities are very much aligned and integrated. So, um, yeah, exactly. Thank you. Great, thanks Molly. Um, and Leah, you uh, know, I wonder if I could just say, I'm sorry, go ahead. Before we move on from Molly, I just wanted to say, it was just fascinating to see the depiction of the community in the way that you showed us that and shared that. It seemed like a glimpse of the future, what you did there to um, mine the literature, uh, which I think, you know, it's daunting that the literature is growing so quickly and, and such a critical field as yours to be able to, you know, gain that insight. So just, I wanted to compliment you and uh, maybe draw you out more about your vision for how to continue to uh, mine the literature and get insight from it like that. That was so cool, like you said. Thank you very much. I mean, I must say that this is the second paper I've done. I did another one on the North American Carbon Program. And the real objective is to demonstrate to decision makers, such as our funding organizations, that we need to have consistent and careful funding that is focused on building communities and solving those really hard problems through time. And it should not be what I think. Nobody cares what Molly thinks. What we want to do is show evidence that's numbers and analysis driven so that we can drive home those points without it being political or like, I want more money from you. No, this is, these are hard numbers. And I think, you know, the hazards community has the same exact issues. You're dealing with super hard problems and you need to show why it matters the way these things are set up. Great. And I think we have barely any time left. Um, so I'll say Leah's question to Claire, which was, um, has the COVID crisis affected the PPE information that you distribute um, or the public acceptance of it? Well, that's a great question. Um, we know that the advice that we give out for respiratory protection in volcanic eruptions is right for air pollution exposures to particles. Um, 
exposure or protection from people with COVID or protecting yourself from other people is a different question. And it has complicated things incredibly because the advice is a bit different. Uh, we need to go out there now and do the research about how the experience of COVID has changed people's perceptions of wearing face masks. Just waiting to be able to go out there and do that work. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Claire. Um, question for the organizers. I, I believe we're out of time. I, there are more questions. Are we, are, we, are we out of time or do we have time for one more question? I'll just keep going if no one's gonna, gonna cut us off um, because the question just came in from Rebecca Morse, um, just asking if the sessions would be available online afterwards, and yes, they will. Um, and uh, sharing presentations with colleagues attending AGU, yes, that these should be available to share. I think it'll take some time to archive those uh, before, uh, it, there might be a little archiving time, but then it'll be available. Okay. Well, I believe we're at the top of the hour. So um, I wanna thank all of our speakers again. Uh, Seth, any, any final words of wisdom? Yeah, I think this just, can you guys hear me? I think this just yeah. demonstrates the value of doing these kind of sessions and the, the sort of commonality of themes and, and through a combination of, I would, I would say Ben and I, either brilliant planning, of course, it's mostly dumb luck. We hit a perfect range of, of topics that really emphasized all the different aspects of this quote, science for solutions thing. And I, I think we can hopefully help AGU formulate it because they, they're they putting in this term, but they, I, think, I don't think there's that much consciousness of what they really mean by it yet. And I think through sheer serendipity, our two sections seem really to have thought about this question for a long time. And so I, I think I really appreciate everybody participating and hopefully we'll, we'll be manage to disseminate this much more broadly. But thanks everybody for all the effort. I know you had to jump through a lot of hoops to get your talks. Um, uh, into the formats that they wanted. So thanks. Great. Thank you all. Thanks to the audience for participating as well. Enjoy the rest of the meeting. <laughs>